good morning, everyone. It's a good day to be in God's presence. Let's go to Psalm 122. Psalm 122. Let's read the whole psalm. There's not many verses. Psalm 122. I rejoiced with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I rejoiced with those who said, let's go to church. I was happy. I was ecstatic. I was full of praise and rejoicing because someone said, let's go to church. Is that you? You you decide. Our feet are standing in your gates, O Jerusalem. We're looking at the city of God, Jerusalem, er Shalom, the city of peace. So they're, they're, they're here now. This is one of the Psalms of Ascents. It's the Psalms they would sing as they walked into God's presence, yeah? So we're here now. We're at the gates. Our feet are standing at the gates. We are to enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts. We are to enter his courts with praise. So we're not praising yet, but we're going to in a moment. At the moment, we're just thankful we've made it here. I, 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 greatest miracle every Sunday is that we get here. I said, Lord, we got here again. Arranging all the kids and all the, you know, getting everything ready and everything prepared. It's like, praise the Lord, everything's, everything's prepared. Jerusalem is built like a city that is closely compacted together. Bit of a strange thing to say, that, isn't it? What's that going to do with anything? Because the emphasis is on the city of God. In other words, the more they get into the city, the more squashed together they get. And if you're claustrophobic, you don't like that, do you? But that's what God wants to do. He wants to bring us together. How good and pleasant it is when brethren dwell together in unity. God, you, you want all your kids happy in the house, don't you? You want everyone together praising God. So it's good that we're all together. It's good that you're squashed in like sardines because it means you've got to focus on God. This is where the tribes go up, the tribes of Israel, to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. So the law is they have to come here to praise God into the city of God, all the different tribes. Now there's 12 different tribes, yeah? And they've all got their own little idiosyncrasies. They're all different characteristics, yeah? That's why you all sit in the same place every Sunday morning. Because you don't want to sit with that tribe. No, it's true. Every church, you've got the spiritual people who are praising and jumping up and down. You've got the more reserved who stay at the back. You've got the people who always just sit in the place, don't know where they are, don't know what's going on, but it doesn't matter, they're here. Whichever tribe you belong to, that's fine. We don't like segregation, but some people force themselves into it. Wherever the tribes go, there stand the thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. We're coming into God's presence. We're coming into the throne room where even the the cherubim, the, the angels, they all praise God. They surround the throne. We're coming to worship the Lord this morning. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Don't just pray for yourself. Don't just praise God. It's the city of God. That's what we're looking at in this series. We'll look at that later after we've praised the Lord. May may those who love you be secure. Who? God? No. No, those who love the city. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and my friends, I will say, peace be within you. We want the whole family to be blessed today. That's why we work so hard at facilitating everything for the whole family. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. The prosperity of God's people. Amen. So we're here at the gates, the psalm of ascents, to come into God's presence, and we do that by praising the Lord. Amen. Amen. Come on then, let's stand up in the Lord's presence. We're about to enter God's presence with praise. I know we've already been in God's presence, many of us praying upstairs in the prayer meeting, worshipping the Lord with thanksgiving, even on our way to church perhaps. But now we're joined together in the presence of God, in the place where the Lord is, his throne room, and we are going to worship the Lord. Father, thank you that we can now join together 
can be compacted together, Lord, every tribe, every family, every person here, with one thing on our minds, to give praise and glory and honor and worship to the Lord our God. So, Lord, thank you for these songs. As we lift up the name of Jesus in praise, we are now going to praise you in the presence of our God, in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit, who is with us and in us. Receive all glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on then, let's praise the Lord. Thank you, team. Okay, the rest of us, we're going to uh, look at God's Word right now. Let's go to the book of Hebrews. The book of Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 1. So we're looking at the city of God in this series. So we've been looking at how God's city is the city of righteousness, how it's the city of the great king, how it's the city of blessing. We've looked at that over the past three weeks. And we've looked at how it's the city where the high priest and the king is, Melchizedek, a picture of Jesus, it's the city where God himself is, where he's present. So we're going to look at another aspect now of the city of God, perhaps the most obvious one, but we need to look at it, and we might look at it actually over the next two weeks. Let's see what we get through today. So this Melchizedek was king of Salem and priest of God Most High. He met Abraham returning from the defeat of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. First, the name Melchizedek means king of righteousness. We've looked at that. Then also, king of Salem, Shalom, means king of peace. He was the king of peace because peace was a place. Salem, or we would say Shalom. The city of peace would be here, Shalom, Jerusalem. Okay, one more verse. Without father or mother, without genealogy, without beginning or days of end, there's nothing recorded in detail about Melchizedek, because he's a picture of Jesus, who is eternal. Without beginning or days of end, resembling the Son of God, he remains a priest for. Ever. So we've been looking at that, how the priest and the king of righteousness in this city, Jerusalem, is a picture of Jesus. And we all know the reason we come to a place is usually to meet with a person. Yeah, if you come to my house, it's usually to come and visit me or my family. If, if we're not there and you come, you're called a burglar. Okay. It, the place is intrinsically connected with the king of that place. It will have the characteristics and the culture of that king, or should have, if everything's going right. And he's the king of righteousness, and he's the king of Salem, which means peace. So we've got this understanding that God is emphasizing not just a person, but a place. The city of God. He's the king of Shalom, he's the king of Salem. Salem is a place. Now, we know that that word Salem, Shalom, means peace. But if you're honest, when we are talking about peace, you don't think of a place. You think of a, a characteristic, an attitude, a rest, a, a something in your spirit, your soul, your mind, your emotions. You think of peace as as something like that. You don't think of it as a place. Because if, if all you needed to get pay, peace was to go to a place, you'd go there all the time, wouldn't you? Yeah? yeah? Sometimes you want your house to be a house of peace. Sometimes that is the last place you can find peace. So you want to get out the house to find peace. Where are you going to go? The Lake District? The Dales? The Peak District, you know, when I want peace, we like to go camping. We always, we always ask for the place furthest away from everybody else because I spend my life surrounded by people, yeah? And, and so peace for me is not having to talk to someone. 
to go somewhere where there is nobody. And I'm looking forward to that again this year. <laughs> so we know this understanding. Go back to verse 2. So Melchizedek means king of righteousness, the city of righteousness. We looked at that last time. And then also the king of Shalom means king of peace. Uh, peace. So Jesus is the king of peace, but it's also a place. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city of peace. Now, we, perhaps in our Western understanding, we probably don't grasp this Middle Eastern Semitic understanding of what shalom means. In its fullness, it, it means so much more than we just think it means. Uh, even Arabic, when you go to a, to a house in an Arab country, you will say, "Assalamu alaikum." It's peace be upon you, peace be upon this house. We're familiar with the Jewish greeting. You would say shalom. You would say peace be. You're not just bestowing peace on a person. You're asking peace to be in a place. And during this series, this is what we're looking at. Now, hopefully you know that Jesus is the King of Peace. Hopefully, we understand that. Go to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. We know this uh, verse very well. We, we sing a song at Christmas about this. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Let's just read the next verse because I, I like reading about Jesus. Of the greatness of his government and peace, shalom. He's the prince of shalom. He's the king of shalom. His government and shalom, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom establishing. Hold on, this is a place. It's not just a person. His kingdom, his government, his throne, and upholding it with justice and righteousness, all the things we've been looking at, from that time on forevermore, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So it's Jesus who brings peace, but he brings it to a place very clearly. He doesn't just let it float around in the air. Peace is not like a feeling, peace is not an emotion. Peace is not just a characteristic of your soul. It can affect all those things, and hopefully you will, you will appropriate it through all those things. But no, peace is a person, and peace is a place. And this is the thing Christians sometimes fail to grasp. We, we know it's a person, and then we think it's a feeling that that person gives us. Well, it's more than that. This shalom is wholeness, well-being. It's not the absence of conflict it's peace in the midst of any trouble. Jerusalem was often surrounded by conflict, but it was the city of peace. And so we're going to look at the city of peace. We're going to look at what this is. Now, go to Genesis 15 and verse 15. If you look in your Bible, just do a concordance search on the word peace in English, this is the first time peace is mentioned. It's never mentioned, you know, in the first few chapters of the Bible, you think it is, but it isn't. And it's God giving Abraham his promises, and he says, you, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. So here, the first time peace, that word peace in, in English is mentioned, it's when God's saying, you will attain peace. Remember, Abraham was called to go to the city, but he had not arrived there. He was looking forward to a greater city. Ultimately, this ultimate place of peace, the city of God, hasn't come yet. Not in its fullness. But we can be in the presence of God now. So we can be in the place where God is now. Abraham did experience peace. How do we know? Because if we go to the previous chapter, verse 14, go to chapter 14 and verse 18, so God's telling him, you will get peace, but 
He's already been to the place of peace. Because the previous chapter, he meets Melchizedek, king of Shalom. Well, he's just been here. So peace isn't just something he's going to get one day. When God's promising him peace, he's already been. He's already met the Prince of Peace. We've just read it in Hebrews chapter 7. He's already met Melchizedek. Melchizedek is already the king of peace, coming from the city of peace, and he gives him bread and wine. He's the priest of God Most High. He blessed Abraham, saying, Blessed be Abraham by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. So he gets the blessing. It's the place of righteousness. He's already experiencing it. That's our situation as Christians right now. Yes, we're looking forward to the final fulfillment, but you can experience it now because Jesus is alive. We're not waiting till death to encounter this. We can encounter this right now. And so when Jesus was born, for unto us a child is born, I've just read that in Isaiah, when the angels came down, what did they say? On earth, shalom, to those on whom his favor rests. So what were the angels saying? Shalom's here now. Jesus is here. He's come. He's landed. The Prince of Peace, from the city of peace, the heavenly Jerusalem, he has now come. And now those on whom God's favor rests, there is shalom. There is peace. Because Jesus is here. So where the presence of God is, that is the place of peace. We're going to look at that this morning. The city of peace. The city of shalom. So you have come to God this morning. Hopefully. You're going to be disappointed if you've not come to God because there's nothing else on offer here. There's entertainment better in other places. We've come to the church. And so we looked at how, in Hebrews, it tells us this city is the church of the firstborn, the church of the living God. So we've come to the place of peace. You are in the place of peace this morning. Not this building, although, although this serve, serves us functionally, but no, the, the gathering of God's people. The place of peace. You've come into the presence of God. The place of peace, the prince of peace. So shalom, whatever your problems, whatever your worries, whatever your fears, whatever your trials, whatever your tribulation, you've now come to the place of peace. Now. Now it's going to get better, but we've come to this place now. Jesus came to bring peace to those, on, those who believed in him on whom his favor rests. It's interesting that's the first time peace is mentioned. The last time peace is mentioned is actually at the end of the Bible, as you would expect, in Revelation. And when you go to Revelation chapter 6, verse 4, let's just go there. Revelation chapter 6, verse 4. Remember, the first three chapters in Revelation talks about the church, so peace is mentioned. But when the church is gone... The Antichrist is released. And plagues and war and famine are released. Another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth. When the church is gone, there is no place of peace on earth. The Prince of Peace takes his bride away. There's no place. It's gone. We need to get into that place of peace now before it's gone. Because when Antichrist comes, he'll take it away. Jesus will have already protected his church, but there will come a time where there is no peace on earth. It's a strange phrase, isn't it? It doesn't just say he made war. It says he is, has the power to take peace. There is none. Nowhere on earth during this time there will be any peace. We're not there yet, but we don't know when that's going to happen. That could come at any moment. And so now we need to make sure we are in the place because at the moment there is peace on earth. It's in Jesus and it's in his church. It's the place of peace. It's the city of peace. So we get that established. It's a person and it 
is a place. Let's go to First Chronicles then. First Chronicles 22, verse 5. So last time we looked at King David, how David captured Jerusalem. He fought many battles, and he won back Ur Shalom, the city of peace. But remember, it had already existed a thousand years before David. David was not creating a place of peace. It was Melchizedek was already had been there a thousand years before. Whatever we do for God, we don't create salvation, we don't create peace. It's God who's established that. We just have to enter it. That's very clear. Jesus is the Melchizedek, the first king and the last king, the first high priest of his city, the final high priest of his city. Jesus always predates and is always eternally future. So even King David didn't create Jerusalem. He just got God's people in. We looked at that uh, previously. David said, my son Solomon. So this is at the end of David's life when he's already captured the city. We looked at that last time. My son Shalom, Solomon, as we would say, because it's a proper name, but it's the word Shalom, a man of peace, is young and inexperienced. And the house to be built for the Lord should be of great magnificence and fame and splendor in the sight of all nations. Now the city needs to be built. The city of God needs the temple building and the palaces and all the, the walls extending, etc. And that's what's going to happen. And David's saying, this has got to be the greatest city because this is the city where God lives the city of God. The splendor in the sight of all nations. All nations are going to come to this city. Therefore, I will make preparations for it. So David made extensive preparations before his death. Let's just keep reading down to get the flavor and context of this. Then he called for his son, Shalomon, Solomon, and charged him to build a house for the Lord, the God of Israel. David said to Solomon, my son, I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord, my God. He was going to create God's presence in God's city. But this word of the Lord came to me. You have shed much blood and have fought many wars. You are not to build a house for my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight. No one man as great as they are, even King David, is perfect. So he can't get the glory for God's city. Only Jesus gets that glory. David couldn't build everything. He could only do so much. But you will have a son. This is what God says to David. You will have a son who will be a man of shalom, a man of peace and rest. And I will give him rest from all his enemies on every side. His name will be Shalom on Solomon. He will be called peace. God named David's son here Shalom. And I will grant Israel shalom, peace, and quiet during his reign. One more verse. He is the one who will build a house for my name. He will be my son, and I will be his father, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom over Israel forever. So God, as God always does, when God's giving a promise, it has an immediate prophetic fulfillment, but it has a future greater revelation. So David obeys God by naming his son Shalom, because he's going to build the city. But if you read what God's actually saying, God's not saying it's Solomon. He's saying, there will be a son comes from you. He will be my son and I will be his father. And he's the one who's going to build it. God always has a double meaning in what he's saying. An immediate fulfillment, but a greater prophetic revelation. He's actually talking about the true man of peace, who is God's literal son and God is his literal father. He's the one who's going to build the city of God. Now Solomon is a picture of that, like David was a picture of that. God's using these people like he uses you and me to do God's will on earth but it's Jesus who is the prince of peace it's Jesus who is the king of peace so David got them in and now Solomon is a picture of the peace that God will bring David is a picture of a man of war David just fought battles all his life 
like Jesus in his first coming. The first king, Jesus came and had to fight and fight and had to shed blood to get us into the city. But now he's reigning in peace, in the city of peace. And now through his battle, he's bringing you into his peace. And this is the picture of what Solomon is. He's called peace, his name's peace, and he's building the city of peace. So it's a name, it's a person, it's a place. Shalom, shalom, shalom. That's what Jesus wants his city to be, to get us into the place of peace. Are you there? I mean, we, we, we use that phrase a lot, don't we? I, I need to get a piece about this. You do. Don't make any decisions. Don't make ever rash decisions, especially important ones, about your life until you get into the place of peace in front of the king of peace so God can give you peace. So that when you're making a decision, it's made in perfect peace based on what you know the king of peace has told you about the place of peace he wants you to be. And if you don't have that, don't move. Stay where you are until God reveals it to you. What did Jesus say to the disciples? Go into the world and preach the gospel to all nations. But then he said something else to them. He said, stay in Jerusalem. Stay in the city of Shalom until you know the power of God has come upon you. The Holy Spirit has come and then you'll do stuff. Don't move out from the place of peace. If you do, you'll get into massive trouble. And then you'll wake up one morning and you won't have a clue what you're doing. And you won't even know where you are or why you did it. And you'll think, well, I had a feeling about this. Peace is not a feeling. It's a person and a place. And God protects us by putting us in this. Okay, let's just look at what Solomon did then. 1 Kings 4, verse 24. 1 Kings 4, verse 24. Kings and Chronicles detail Solomon's reign extensively. So this is a picture of the place and the person. So Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms west of the U river Euphrates from... Uh, Tifsa to Gaza and had peace on all sides. Solomon's a picture of the millennial reign of Christ. When we come to Jesus, he will give you rest on all sides. There'll still be enemies around, but you'll have rest in him when you're with him. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, everyone under their own vine and under their own fig tree. So when we come to Jesus... We don't just come to the Prince of Peace. We don't just receive our righteousness, the city of righteousness. We don't just receive the blessing. We don't just receive our salvation. We receive a place where we can resort to, to obtain peace. His kingdom, his city, his church. If you haven't got peace, it might be you've not come into God's peace. Believing in Jesus is the only part of the process. Now, all peace comes from Jesus, but the city is the place of peace. You can believe in Jesus and not have peace because you're not in the place God wants you to be. You've got to keep following the Prince of Peace till he brings you into the place of peace, till he brings you into the shalom. We're going to look at this a little bit more extensively, but this is a living reality. You must be in that place. Or not only will you not have peace, which will cause stress and anxiety and all kinds of disorders, spiritual as well as mental and physical, but you'll end up making a shipwreck of things because you'll be doing things in places you shouldn't have even been. You just got upset or you reacted against something. So Solomon's picture is a picture of all this, but the reality is found in Jesus. Yeah? So did Jesus come to Jerusalem? Yeah, it is yes, but there were only five people said yes. So let's just pretend I've not said that and I'll ask it again, okay? <laughs> so Solomon's a picture and Jerusalem is a picture, but the reality is in Christ. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, yeah? But, <laughs> this will surprise you, this will. Did he come to the place of peace? Yes. Wow, he did. Why? Why didn't he stay in Galilee? And now, those of you who've been to Jerusalem and, and been to Israel on our tours, 
Everybody loves it in Galilee. You're on the lake, and it's pe- there's, there's no big cities, and you travel on the boat. Oh, it's just, you know, I, I remember once, we, I don't know if it was the last two or other time before, and there was a mix-up in the itinerary, and so we couldn't go to the Nazareth village, and so we had to have a day off. We had to have a day off sat by the Lake of Galilee. <laughs> it was awful. <laughs> it was the best day, I, it's the best day I've ever had in Israel. We didn't do anything. We just went in the pool and went swimming in Galilee and with the fish. And it's like, wow, you get up, you look at the sunrise over Golan and it's like, this is where Jesus lived. And it's quiet and peaceful. Jerusalem is not quiet and peaceful. You know, you walk through the old city, you hold your bag tight, you're terrified about what's going to happen. You don't know what's going on. You, there's noise, there's shout, there's crowds, there's, it's... You know, far from peace. Why didn't, if Jesus came to bring peace, why didn't he stay in Galilee? That's peaceful up in Galilee. Because he'd come to bring peace to the city of Shalom. And that's why Jesus always stressed, we must go to Jerusalem. We have to go to Jerusalem. Remember, Jesus wasn't from Jerusalem. He was a northerner. He lived up north. You know, we don't like going down south, do we? (laughs) What do you want? You know, when I I travel the world and people say, oh, you're from England, London. I've been to London many times and I always go, I'm not from London. Go, yeah, it's the same place. It jolly well is not the same place. (laughs) I live in Yorkshire. How dare you suggest we are like Cockneys? (laughs) If you are from London, God bless you you may still get into heaven. (laughs) Why why do you want to leave Yorkshire? We've got everything here. Jesus set his face resolutely. We've got to go to Jerusalem. And then he said, for surely no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem. He knew he was going to die when he got to Jerusalem. But yet he was still going to go. Because the Prince of Peace had to bring peace to the city of peace. Jesus is the Prince of Peace, but he wants to bring peace to you, and he wants to bring you into his city. We sang it this morning. We're standing at your gates, O Jerusalem. We're going to enter the city of peace. We've got to get into the place. Okay, let's look at that then. Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, verse 37. So Jesus came to Jerusalem. Now, Throughout his life, he had visited Jerusalem, but really, when you read the Gospels, especially John's Gospel, um, the the narrative about Jesus' time in Jerusalem is really this last visit, this last week. It's nearly all about that when you read about Jesus in Jerusalem. It's it's mainly about that last visit to Jerusalem. There are other instances, but this is the main one. When he came near to the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives. So this is when you just come up over the crest of the Mount of Olives and you see Jerusalem for the first time. So him and all his disciples, you don't see it because you have to come come up from Jericho and it's not until you get over the mountain you can see Jerusalem. You can't see it before that. Then suddenly you get to that and suddenly you can see it all. See the temple, the, the city, you can see everything. It's a magnificent view. He came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives. So he can see Jerusalem now for the first time, everyone with him, first time on this trip. The whole crowd of disciples began to joyfully, to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. So everyone now is getting excited because the Prince of Peace is taking them into the city of peace. Shalom. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. That's not just something they said. That's a prophetic statement of the coming of Messiah. In Jewish understanding, Baruch Habah B'Shem Adonai is what you say when the son of David, the Messiah, God's son, comes to Jerusalem. That's what you greet him with. So they're saying the Prince of Peace, David's greatest son, greater than Solomon, is now here. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yeah? Notice what they say next. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. 
So they're now saying the peace, the peace of heaven, the Prince of Peace, come to the city of peace, shalom, shalom, shalom. So now peace is here. And they were right. Peace was here. Jesus had come. Peace on earth to those on whom God's favor rests. Jesus came to bring peace to people. And so what they're saying is correct. Peace has arrived. And so if you want to meet the Prince of Peace, if you need to connect with this peace, where have you got to be? In Jerusalem. Now he come at Passover. So that's when all the Jews had come to Jerusalem anyway. That's the one day in the year, the one week, that festival of unleavened bread that we celebrate Passover with, our communion service. So everyone's come now to the place of peace, to the city of peace. They were commanded by God. You've got to go to Jerusalem, the place, the city I designate. So they were obedient Jews. They did that. And so peace had now arrived. Yeah? Everything's fine. Look at the next verse. So some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Some people are not happy. They want people to shut up. They want people to be quiet. Stop saying, peace has arrived. Don't you know the trouble we've got? We've got all the Romans and we've got the Herod, Herodians and we've got all these zealots and we've got conflict and civil war on the horizon. Tell them to be quiet. Jesus says, I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. Yeah? As he approached Jerusalem... So he's coming down the Mount of Olives. You can see Jerusalem getting closer and closer as you enter. He saw the city. And he wept. Why? He's come to bring peace. He's come to the city of peace. He is the Prince of Peace. Why is he weeping now when he sees the city? Next verse. He said, if you, who... The city of peace, the place of peace, the people of peace, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace. But now it is hidden from your eyes. Jesus knew that although he was the prince of peace, although he was bringing peace, although he was coming to the place of peace, he knew they didn't receive him. But they were shouting peace. Yes, they were. They were in the city of peace. Yes, they were. But they weren't going to listen to Jesus. Now, if that's true of them, it can certainly be true of us. But I've come to church. I'm in the place of peace. So were they. But I'm in the presence of Jesus. So were they. Well, I've been singing praise. So, so were they. They were singing Baruch Hababa Shem Adonai. They were singing, blessed be you who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace is now here. They were saying all the right stuff. But the minute Jesus would start teaching something they didn't like, they weren't having it. And sadly, there's far too many Christians just like that. They want to sing the songs. They might want to come to the church. They might genuinely believe in Jesus. But the minute they're confronted with something that they don't like, they reject that peace. And Jesus weeps. Why aren't you receiving what I want to give you? Now, Jesus knew he'd got some hard things to do. What's the first thing he does when he walks into the temple? Kicks everything over. If we were there with Jesus, would we have reasoned with him a bit? Now, come on, Lord. Be nice today. Carolyn says this to me sometimes. <laughs> She's not here, so I never said that. You know... Just, just be encouraging. Just be nice to them. You know, just, just come into the temple, do a few miracles, preach a really nice sermon about how much you love everybody and you accept everybody, even if they live in sinful. Just be really nice. Perhaps with a reason. It wouldn't have got you anywhere. It's like when Caroline tells me, it's like, well, I'll just do what I think God wants us to do. No, he goes in, he kicks over the table and scatters the money changers' money. And what's he doing? He's like, my house. This is to be a house of prayer. He had come to bring peace, but it has to be peace 
It has to be peace in the way God designates it. We can't say we want peace on our demands. We've got to submit to what God wants to do for, to bring peace. And the first thing Jesus wanted to do to bring peace was to get rid of everybody who wasn't righteous. And so he knew they were going to reject him. He knew what people's hearts are like. We know that. I know that. I know when some people aren't going to listen to what God says. You think, well, what's the point of telling them then? Now, fortunately, there's enough people listening to what God says so that we can, we can meet together and have unity. But there's always people rejecting what God's doing. They're singing it, but they're not going to do it. And so Jesus comes and he weeps and there is no peace. He says, today, today, if you knew what would bring you peace, but I'm in the city of peace, I'm singing songs of peace, I'm listening to Jesus. Yeah, but you're not really receiving it and living it. You're just giving a token. Jesus says, Isaiah was right. He says that he prophesied, you honor me with your lips, but your hearts are far from me. They were singing songs all that week in Jerusalem. They were singing the songs of ascent, the psalms we've been singing this morning. But many of them were not going to accept what Jesus wanted to do. And today, God wants to bring peace into the church. How does he do that? However he wants to do that. He might want to comfort you. He might want to encourage you. He might want to correct you. He might want to rebuke you. He might want to kick some tables over. However Jesus acts is however we have to allow him to act. Because that's what brings peace. You know, this last couple of years, I've realized the way God brings me peace is he started removing people from my life. And I'm trying to hold on to things, and God's saying, no, don't hold on to that. That will not bring you peace. Let it go. Churches, nations, did they receive it? No. And so if you read Matthew's account, go to Matthew 23, verse 37. Matthew 23, verse 37. This is the same uh, instance, Jesus coming to Jerusalem. Notice what Jesus says here. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, city of peace, city of peace. You who kill the prophets, you who stole those who've been sent to you, always rejecting what God's trying to do, rejecting the leaders God sends to you. How often I have longed to gather you and your, your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. Within that generation, Jerusalem would be destroyed. The city of peace would be annihilated by war. Why? They rejected the Prince of Peace. They were in the right place, but they weren't listening to what the right things God was telling them to do. If they can do it, we can do it. Look, your house is left to you desolate. One more verse. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, Baruch Habab Hashem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But that's just what they've been singing. They've just sung that. We've just read it in Luke. They're singing Baruch Habab Hashem Adonai. Jesus says, you won't have peace again until you say that. And they would have looked at him and gone, well, we are saying that. Yeah, but you don't mean it. You mean it today, but tomorrow you'll forget about it. And by the end of the week, you'll be shouting, crucify, crucify because I've not given you what you want. You see, Jesus knew he was going to have to come a second time. And the second time, he is going to establish peace at Jerusalem, because he is going to rule on David's throne, and he is going to rule in righteousness. And the second time, they're going to sing it, and they're going to mean it, because it's going to be a cry of salvation. We finally, Baruch, blessed, Habab Hashem Adonai, the one who comes in Hashem, the one who comes in the name. Where does God say he puts his name? In Jerusalem. There I have put my name. So there is a time coming, even though they're rejecting that day what Jesus has come to bring, peace to the city of peace, that doesn't mean he's still not going to bring it. He's still bringing it. 
It's still happening. They're just going to have a 2,000 year delay because of their stubborn pride. And, and often we can reject God because of our, our arrogance or our stiff necked hard heartedness and think we're right and we, we, we're not having this and we're not listening to him and we're leaving that church and we're doing this. Jesus is still going to do it. Do you want it quickly or do you want 2,000 years of misery before you get it? Because Jerusalem has had 2,000 years of misery since they rejected the Prince of Peace. And it's been destroyed and captured and destroyed and captured. And the Jews were never even allowed back until our generation. This is the first time Israel is back in Jerusalem, owning Jerusalem since the time of Jesus. Is this because he's coming back? It is. Because the Jews, more than ever before, since the time of Jesus, are now turning to Messiah. They're now saying, Baruch Habar B'Shem Adonai. Blessed is the true Messiah, Yeshua. Jesus, they're believing in him. Jesus says that means he's coming back. We don't know when, but the signs are all there. So he's saying it's still going to happen. It's still going to be fulfilled. The issue is, are you receiving it today? Jesus says, today if you knew what brings you peace, today if you knew the Prince of Peace were here, today you could enter into the place of Peace. Okay, let's look at a process then of how the pattern in the Old Testament revealed this to us. Let's go to the first book of Kings. First book of Kings, chapter 8 and verse 1. So obviously these are pictures, the reality is in Christ. But we've seen Solomon was the picture. Because he's the man of peace, bringing peace to the city of peace. To the people who should have peace. So King Solomon summoned into his presence. So what's Solomon going to do? He's going to build a city. Well, it's no good building a city of peace if no one lives there, is it? Although I'd quite like that. <laughs> I would love to live in a city where there was only me lived there. Wouldn't that be lovely? Anyway. King Solomon summoned into his presence at Yer Shalom. At the city of peace. So Solomon, I'm a man of peace, right? I built a city of peace. So now I've got to get all the people into that peace, into that shalom. Yeah, that's, that's the hard thing. The hard thing is getting God's people to where they should be. It's obvious, but it's still hard. It's easy. Everyone can do it, but people have got other plans. So into his presence at Jerusalem, the elders of Israel... Get the leaders there. Well, that'd be a good start, wouldn't it? At least the leaders might turn up. All the heads of the tribes, so the family heads, well, at least they might turn up. And the chiefs of the Israelite families, well, family representatives, at least they, they might turn up. To bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Zion, the city of David. Where's God's presence? In the city. The ark is always the picture of God's presence. You know that. Don't have to establish that. So they're now going to bring something that's already there into a greater presence. We're going to get the ark now to the top of the hill, still in the city. God's, we're, going to, we're going to go up the Song of Ascents. We're going to go up into God's presence, yeah? Well, that's easy. It, it's not because you've got to get all God's people to do it. And that's the hard bit. You know, sometimes when I meet with other pastors and they say, what you need to do is you do this. Pastors are brilliant at giving instructions. Have you noticed that? Oh, they're great at telling you what to do. Don't mean anyone's going to do it. But, but they're brilliant at telling you what to do. Yeah, but the hard thing is getting everyone to do it. Pastor said to me, you need to do this, you need to do that. You know, and I talk with pastors in other countries and they say, you need to do this. I go, British people are not going to do that. Oh, they will if you tell them. No, I'd have to whip them. <laughs> and then they'd leave church because I whipped them. It's just they would not do it. Anyway, let's go down. Next verse. So we've got to into the city of peace. All the Israelites came together to King Solomon. So they all come to the man of peace at the time of the festival in the month of Ethanim, the seventh month. Right. Grab that. Because this is not Passover. Passover is the first month. Right, breaking of bread, that's the first thing. This is the seventh month. This is at the end of the festival cycle. Yeah? So the festival in the seventh month, does anyone know what festival that is? 
Oh my goodness, we did, we did a whole study on this in Revelation. So we're not going on until, until somebody tells me what the final festival is. Tabernacles, thank you, Pastor John, but I knew you knew. <laughs> right, seven feasts. The seventh month is the final feast of tabernacles. So this is the festival. What is tabernacles? It's where God comes and lives with everyone in the city. Booths, tents, they're all living together, yeah? It's the final sevenfold Moedim, the final feast. So Solomon's saying, well, you, you didn't come to Passover, you didn't come to Pentecost, you didn't come to First Fruits or Rosh Hashanah or all the, the other, but you will surely come when God turns up. And you are going to be ready when Jesus comes, aren't you? You are going to come to that meeting when he comes. We'll, we'll put it in the notices the week before. Next Sunday, rapture, be here. <laughs> Put that in, Joseph, just to see who doesn't turn up. There'll be someone. Oh, I'm busy that day. Oh, good luck. All the Israelites came together. That Hebrew word for all means everybody. I have no idea what it means, actually. I don't even know what word it is, but it says also it means all. All the Israelites came together. Together, oneness, unity. They're all going to turn up. Solomon must have fainted when that happened. Oh, everyone's come. At the time of the festival of the month of Ethanem, the seventh month, when all the elders, all the leadership's going to turn up as well, which is usually the case here, but everyone's turning up. When all the Israel, when all the elders had arrived, the priest took up the ark, the presence of God. Right, God's turned up. Isn't it great when God turns up? You see, if we turn up, God turns up. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Come to God, he will come to you. Yeah? They brought the ark of the Lord and the tent of meeting, the presence of God, and all the sacred furnishings, all the equipment, it's like going camping. When, you know, we have to take a fridge camping now. All the furnishings with it, the priests and the Levites carried them up. Everyone's coming where? Into the city of God. Can you see this? Well, we don't have to come to Jerusalem to meet with God. Yes, you do. Because that's what God said you've got to do. Shalom isn't just a person, it's a place. It's the city of God, the city of peace, where the king of peace is. And King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel that had gathered about him were before the ark, sacrificing as many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. Sacrifice and blessing. Remember, when they sacrificed sheep and cattle, they ate it. So don't think this is just like an abattoir. It's a barbecue. <laughs> lamb, sheep, lamb kebabs. Cattle, steak. This is like the best barbecue you'll ever go to. They couldn't count the amount of food. You know, in, in a time where food was, you know, a luxury, not just a, you know, not just a luxury, it was a necessity. They've got everything they need. More than they can eat. Can't even count how much food there is. Next verse. All in the city of God. The priest then brought the Ark of the Lord's Covenant to its place in the temple in the city of God, to the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the, the, the cherubim. So, so now, all God's people are in the place of peace. Who's the king? Solomon, the king of peace. Yeah? And they're enjoying peace because there's no battle. Under David, they're, all, they're fighting all the time. There's no, they're now in peace with the Prince of Peace in the city of peace. The presence of God is there. Yeah? That's where God wants us to be. That's where God wants you to be. He wants his peace to be upon you. So that's the correct process. If that happens, peace is a reality. Notice it's Solomon that does this in the city of peace. You've got to banish from your mind the thought that you can create peace any other way. 
Because we like to think, if I can just arrange this, if I can just sort this out in my life, if I can just manipulate this, and especially when it comes to other people, if I can just make this person stop doing that, it'll stop irritating me and I'll be at peace. Well, good luck, you'll spend all your life trying to do that, because the, the devil will always send someone to irritate you. Even God will. No, you've got to come into the place of peace, to the Prince of Peace, into his presence, united together in the peace of God. Keep the unity of the bond of peace. Keep the unity of the spirit of peace. You can't create it. You receive it and enter into it. If you're trying to achieve it, you are trying to achieve something by your own works and you will never establish it. That's what Babylon was doing. We'll try and create peace on earth, but at the end up creating a dictatorship where you make everyone have to obey you. That's not how Jesus has done it. Jesus is, is peace. He's created a place of peace and he in, invites you into his peace. That's where when Jesus rose from the, the grave, he came to his disciples and he breathed on them and said, Shalom, I'm giving you my peace. Stay in the city till the spirit comes. Because then you'll be under the Prince of Peace, you'll be in the place of peace and you'll have it. Don't try to create it your own way. So everyone was there. Everyone. All God's people. And if you read the story, when they got the ark in and when they, when, they, when they dedicated the temple, God's fire came down and they, they all worshipped the Lord. Because they were all together in one place. Does that phrase sound familiar? Yeah. Yes, because 2,000, well, 1,000 years later, 2,000 years ago to us, it says all Jesus' disciples, the true church, they were all together in one place place where was that place Jerusalem they were all together in the place the city of peace why Jesus says don't leave the city stay where you are and then he'll come now he'd already breathed on them saying receive peace peace I leave with you I'm going to create a place for you but peace I leave with you he breathed, he did it more than once actually. He kept saying peace to them. When he arrived in the room, he said shalom. And then he breathed and said, receive shalom. And then he said shalom again. And he says, stay in the place. They were all together in one place. They were all together in the church. They were the church. It wasn't the building they were in. Although they were in the right city where God wanted them to be. And they were at the temple where God wanted them to be. So... That's when they received peace. Go to Psalm 133. Psalm 133. Well-known Psalm. Let's read it all. There's only a few verses. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Actually, that's miraculous. It's, it's the greatest miracle ever to get people to live together in unity. It's like precious oil poured down on the head, the oil, the anointing oil of the Holy Spirit, running down the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, who's Aaron, the high priest, the anointing comes from him, Jesus, Melchizedek, on us, down on the collar of his robe, on, his, on our garments, the garments of righteousness, as if the Jew of Hermon, Hermon is the biggest mountain in Israel, so there's lots of dew, there's so much dew up there, it's covered in snow most of the year. We're falling on Mount Zion. So it's as if all the blessing, all the rain, all the moisture, all the prosperity, all the anointing is coming on Jerusalem. The place of peace. For there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. So how do they get that blessing? How do they get that anointing? How do they get all that great goodness from God by being in the right place? That's what it says. If you will come together in unity to Mount Zion, all the moisture, all the blessing, all the, all the anointing of God will come upon you. Why? Because you're in the right place. For there, the Lord bestows the blessing. Well, I haven't got to bless me wherever I am. Well, he won't. 
He'll bless you if you're under the Prince of Peace where the Prince of Peace has told you to be. That's where the blessing is. Abraham had to go to the place to receive the blessing. The church, Zion, Jerusalem, the city of peace, the place of tabernacles, the place of the ark, the place of God's presence. God's presence is everywhere. Not in the same way it's not. God's presence is where God's people meet together. We've looked at that over and over again in the scriptures. It's where the unity is that the blessing of peace comes. The city of the living God. Go to 1 Kings again then. Go to chapter 3 and verse 1. So this is actually before all the people gather. You'll notice he does similar things to what David did in Jerusalem. But he's bringing a greater peace because he's a picture of the greater revelation of Jesus Christ. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. So what's he doing? He's building everything. He's building the city. He's building the temple. He's building the temple of the Lord and he's building the wall around Jerusalem. But he hasn't done that yet. But before he's finished building the city of peace, what's the first thing he does? He brings his bride into the city. Who's the bride? The church. Us. What's God doing? He's bringing you into his presence. Yeah, but it's not finished yet. He doesn't care. He wants you first. He wants you in the city first. But Jesus hasn't come back yet. I know that. He might not have finished building the houses for us yet. I go to prepare a place for you in my father's house and many mansions. I go to build a place for you. That might not be finished. He still wants you now, today, in his presence. He wants his bride brought in. Where's he going to put her? I don't know. The broom closet. Doesn't matter. Get her in. Just get her in. You know, if, if, if you were at the ark and, the, and the, you know, Noah's ark and, and the rain started, you wouldn't say, oh, well, I'm not getting on there unless I've got a luxury cabin. <laughs> have, have I got a cabin with a view? Can I go on the deck? You won't want to go on the deck. Get in. Get in to the place where the Prince of Peace has created for you. He wants you safe. I want the bride in. I want her out of Egypt because Egypt's a picture of the world. It's a picture of sin and slavery. I don't care. I'm not going to wait. He didn't say, Pharaoh, keep your daughter till I've finished. It'll be seven years till he finishes building. It'll be longer than that, actually. That was just the temple. It took much longer to build the palace. I think it took 14 years to build most of the stuff. Can't wait 14 years to get his bride. And he wants his bride in his presence now. Jesus wants you in his peace now. Well, I'll have peace one day. No, you can have peace now. You can come into God's presence now. What about all my trouble? Doesn't matter. Come into the shalom of God now. Prince of peace is reigning now. High priest is reigning now. Presence of God is now. Get in now. There is no excuse for you not to be in God's peace. He's bringing you in. Right now, the bride. And then at the end of his reign, go to chapter 10, verse 2. What happens next? At the end of his reign. Go to verse 1. The queen of Sheba heard all about the fame of the man of peace, Solomon, and his relationship to the Lord. She came to test the man of peace with hard questions. So now we've got an even greater bride coming. Remember Jesus said... The queen of the south came to hear Solomon's wisdom. One greater than Solomon is here. Jesus is bringing all his bride. Even the queen of Sheba, who's a picture, a typology of the, the church. Remember the first, after the Jews were saved, Philip went down to the Ethiopian to the queen of the south. He wanted to make sure she was saved pretty quick. Arriving at Jerusalem, what does she do? She comes to Jerusalem. You can tell they weren't married, can't you? Because if they were married, he'd have had to go to her. <laughs> Even in Sheba, she'd have just shouted him. That's what being married is, isn't it? It's just shouting at each other from different rooms. <laughs> you know when you hear that name, shouted, and you sit there thinking, is it worth going upstairs to find out what it is? <laughs> Shall I pretend I've not heard? 
Will it be something stupid? And it's yes, yes and amen to all those. <laughs> so you're doing is, you know, you climb upstairs with all your arthritis and all that, and you go, what? Anyway, forget that. Forget <laughs> that. I didn't say any of that. Where does she come? Jerusalem. She's got to come to him. Come, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you the rest. His peace he gives to you, but you have to come to him. You can't shout him. He shouts you. He calls you name. Arriving at Jerusalem with a great caravan, she brings everything she's got. She came to Solomon and talked with him about all she had on her mind. Sol Solomon answered all her questions. Nothing was too hard for the king to explain to her. The queen's got to come. The bride's got to come. The church. We've all got to come into God's presence. You've got to come to Jesus. You've got to come to the place he wants you to be. Okay, let's move on then. So, the queen comes. The church has to come. He creates a palace for her. He creates a place for her, his, his bride. He doesn't marry the queen of Sheba because she's a type of the, in the same way Solomon is not the true son of God Christ. The, the queen of Sheba couldn't marry Solomon because she's the picture of the church to come who's given to Jesus. So, Jesus gives us his peace and he breathes his peace into us and so Jesus when he's resurrected he comes to his church they were all together in one place because Jesus had told them and so he breathes his peace into them they're in the place of peace and they receive his peace okay let's go let's pull this together then Psalm 122 which is how we started off this meeting before we sung our prayers and before we worshiped the Lord we started with this Psalm, go to verse um, 6. Go to verse 6. We've already read this psalm. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Why? If there's one city on earth of 2,000 years hasn't had any peace, it's Jerusalem. So the prayers are not working much, are they? I mean, there's rioting. There's been, there's been murders in Israel this week, several terrorist attacks. There's been rioting on the Temple Mount. A policeman killed in Jerusalem, where the temple was just a few days ago. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May those who love you be secure. Those who love Jerusalem will be secure. What's Jerusalem. It's the place of peace. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, peace be within you. Verse 9. Peace, peace, peace. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your prosperity. Can you see what's happening here? The prayers and the blessing and the family prosperity and everything is dependent upon praying for the place God has put you. Unfortunately, too many Christians love the Prince of Peace, but they don't love the place of peace. And they don't pray for the church. They pray about their needs and they pray to the Prince of Peace, but too many Christians don't love their church. Well, there'll be no prosperity then on your family and there'll be no blessing on your family because we are told to pray for the place. No, I pray to God for my needs. That isn't what it says. It says you pray for the place. You pray for Jerusalem. You, you pray for the place of peace. I know people go to church, they hate their church. They're always criticizing it. They're always grumbling against it. Well, there'll be no prosperity then. There'll be no blessing. God won't bless you. You can't. You're not blessing the place of peace. Well, I believe in God. What's that got to do with it? Well, I believe in the Prince of Peace. What's that got to do with it? It doesn't say pray for the Prince of Peace. It says pray for the place of peace. Yeah? Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Well, what's that? That's the place God puts his people. Well, I'm not praying for a city. Well, you should. 
We should pray for God's people. We should pray for the place God puts us. We should be constantly praying for the church because it's the church that gets attacked. Satan didn't attack Jesus. He's terrified of him. He's scared of his name. But he'll attack the church. But if we won't pray for the church, Satan knows he's going to win because he knows we'll just let him in. We've got to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Jump back to the beginning. We read this at the beginning, verse 2 of the same psalm. What's he talking about? Our feet are standing at your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is, is, a, is built like a city that is closely compacted together. There the tribes go up. You're praying for your brothers and sisters. You're praying for your family members. You're praying for the church. You're praying for the place of peace, the church of the living God, the city of God. You're not there to get what you can. You're there to pray for its blessing. And if we get that, then your family will be blessed. When you pray for God's family, God will bless your family. You curse God's family, see what happens to yours. It's just the law of reciprocation. You reap what you sow. It's so sad when you see people criticizing and grumbling against the church and speaking bad things against the church and then terrible things happen to their family and they make no connection between it. The blessing is ordained this way. Jesus said it. Look at Luke chapter 10, verse 5. Luke 10, verse 5. So this is Jesus sending out his disciples. How do we know where to go? Many of you have had that problem in your life. Which church should you belong to? Lots of churches out there. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. Shalom. Yeah? Assalamu alaikum in Arabic. Shalom in Hebrew. Peace. If someone who promotes peace is there, I think the King James says, if there is a man of peace there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. What's Jesus talking about? Have you ever read this? Then what's he talking about? He's talking about a place of peace. Which church should I go to? You should find a church that is a place of God's presence. You should be in a church that is a place of peace. You should be in a church who has a man of peace there, on whom your peace can rest, and on whose his peace can rest on you. At least one person, when you enter this city, so when you go somewhere, there'll be someone in that city There'll be some church around. There'll be somewhere where there's peace, where you can worship God. There's, there's got to be somewhere. There's somewhere within traveling distance. I get emails every day. Sometimes people telling me that there's no church. And I used to say, well, there must be a church close by. Find one. But lots of people saying, can we join your church? They live in Alaska. They do, they do. I get churches from all, we get emails from people all over the world. And sometimes they say, no, Pastor Dave, I, I live in the middle of nowhere. I live a hundred miles from the nearest town. There is no church for me to attend. I said, well, okay, you can watch us online, but you still try and need to find some Christians to, to fellowship with, who you can be accountable to and in, in, in relation and connectivity with. But Jesus is saying, look, you find a man of peace. Find a place where there are people who are in God's presence, who believe in God's word, who praise God in God's presence, praise the Prince of Peace. It's a place of peace so that your peace can rest there. And if there isn't anywhere, still go and let your peace rest upon you. So at least you can put peace on other people. So if you ate the pasta, but there's nowhere else to go, still go and bless people. Amen? Peace, a place of peace. This is what we have to do. You'll notice all the letters when Paul, the apostles they wrote, they would say, peace be upon you. Grace and peace to you. Peace be with you. They weren't just saying it. They wanted it. They wanted the shalom to be breathed into that church. Joshua chapter 6, verse 23. And we're going to come to communion. Judges, sorry, 6, chapter 23, not Joshua. So this is Gideon. Gideon's surrounded by Midianites that keep nicking all his food. 
He's in a terrible situation. But the Lord said to Gideon, Shalom. Gideon said, but, but Lord, you've no idea what's going on. Of course, he, of course he knows what's going on. Shalom. Just like Jesus did. Shalom. Don't be afraid. You're not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it Yahweh Shalom. But what did he call Yahweh Shalom? Did he, now Yahweh Shalom is God's name. So he says the Lord is peace. Yeah? But that isn't what he called God is peace. He called the place God is peace. Yeah? God is peace. I know God is peace. But do you call the place where you are God is peace? Do you say God's shalom is here? Oh no, there's no peace in our church. Yes, there is. It just means you're not entering into it. It's a place. To this day, it stands in Ophrah of the Abiz rites. Written later, they say it's still there. Get into the place of peace. And so we're going to come to the the place of peace. We're going to come and celebrate communion. You'll notice throughout the Bible, God says, you know, when he says, if my people are called by my name, and when he tells people to pray, he says, if they turn their faces to this city that is called by my name, then he will deliver them from their enemies. Then he will restore them into his presence. But notice what he said. He doesn't say if they pray. He says, if they turn their faces towards my place. If they pray for the church, I'll hear them. If they want the church to be built, I'll hear them. If they speak blessing over the church, I'll hear them. But if they grumble or criticize, they're not going in. They're staying in the desert. In fact, Daniel, you remember Daniel's story? When it was against the law to pray, what did he do? He opened the windows and it says he looked towards Jerusalem. Why? What are you looking towards Jerusalem for? Because that's where God's name is. That's where Jesus is coming. He's coming for the church. He's put his name over the church. Are you in it? Do we belong to it? Isaiah chapter 33 and verse 17. You've got to see it. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty and, uh, and view a land that stretches afar. Your eyes have got to see the king of peace. Can you see Jesus? When we're going to come and break bread in a moment, we're going to worship the Lord first. It's so we can see Jesus. Jesus would break the bread and then they saw him. This is my body. This is my blood. This is the bread. This is the wine. It's all so we can see the king. The king of Salem. The king of Shalom. The king of peace. But jump to verse 20. Same prophecy. You will see the king of peace. Look on Zion. The city of our festivals. Your eyes will see your Shalom. A peaceful abode, a tent that will not move. Jesus says, I will build my church and it won't move till he takes it to himself. So don't just say, well, I see the king. Yeah, do you see his city? Do you see Jerusalem? Do you see Zion? Do you see the church? Because at the end of time in Revelation, John when he'd seen Jesus and seen the whole history, the angel says, come, I'll show you the city. The greatest revelation is yet to come. We've got to see Jesus, but we've got to see the place where he wants his presence to be. Can the team come up, please? We're going to take communion. We're going to worship the Lord. Before we break the bread, we're going to sing this song of worship. Can you just put up this scripture? Ezekiel chapter 37 and verse 26. So Ezekiel was cast out of the city because of the rebellion and stubbornness of God's people. He threw them out of the city. They lost the place of peace. But Ezekiel prophesied a return. 
And he says, this is what God says, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant. I will establish them and increase their numbers, and I will put my sanctuary among them forever. My dwelling place will be with them. I will be their God, and they will be my people. God's saying, I'm going to give you a covenant, and this is going to bring you peace. And then there's going to be a place for you to experience that peace. He's going to dwell with us, and his presence is going to be with us. So when we're taking communion, we're not just remembering Jesus. We're accepting where he's put us. The covenant of peace. The team are going to lead us in this song of praise and worship. We're going to worship the Lord. Then we're going to break bread together. Let's worship the Lord. Thank you, team.